everybody for joining us today. And we thought this topic would be very timely because there's a lot of things happening in the industry right now. So the concept of navigating the new normal and you know, cost saving in general in the pharmaceutical and biotech industry is something that not enough people talk about. I think from a perspective, we're really focusing on small biotechs um, to talk about that and, and help companies to understand what we can do together. We, brought the, we thought we'd bring together a panel today. Um, I was talking with KO. Callian is, is, uh, runs his own company, Clint.ai, and we work together on a bunch of different things. And I thought that this would be a great opportunity for us to uh, bring things together. I am the CEO of Court Square Group. We are a managed service firm and we manage infrastructure for life science companies. Some of the largest companies out there, as well as we have a lot of startup companies that we work with. So um, I see a totally different way that some people work when they're dealing with large companies versus small companies. Um, many of you have heard the issue of the big silos in these big companies and, and how they get, they're so um, tough to get any work done. Well, the reality is that the small smaller companies, everybody's got to roll up their sleeves and get a lot of work done. And it's all dependent upon how you pick your vendors, how you work with your companies, how you work with your employees and, and how you move a company forward. So I think today we've got a great panel that's going to talk a lot about that. And we're, we're going to go through a lot of different topics, particularly around um, how we do vendor selection, how we work with, with other vendors and how we work with partners. Because I look at my customers as, as partners. We help to work together on solutions that we were bringing out there. With that being said, let me uh, hand it off to KO. Uh, Kalyan? Thanks, Keith. So my name is Kalyan Obalimpali, and if you think it's a, it's a little bit of a tongue twister, when I was born, I had 42 characters in my name. So this is the shortened version, but I've shortened it further. I just go by KO, KO like a knockout. So if it's easier, you could you know you can just call call me KO. Um, I think Keith did a great job of going through what we're going to talk about today. The format is we don't have any slides, and the goal was just to have a conversation, and we're hoping that you can take a couple of things back. But before I get into the content of the presentation itself, um, I've worked in clinical operations prior to starting a Clin AI. I've been in clinical operations role, started my career as a CRA, and all the way to a senior director of clinical operations before at which time I quit and I started this company. But essentially, I've been running teams um, or running clinical operations, running clinical trials. That's been my career for the for the 18 years that I've worked. And uh, currently, I'm uh, the founder and CEO of Clin AI, which is a platform for pharma companies and biotech companies to create RFPs, send them to the vendors. And uh, you know, essentially, the whole RFP process, we've automated it, and we provide you with analytics so that you don't have to use Excel files anymore. Because I felt that you know, selecting vendors for 30 40, 20, even $2 million using cell files was, was a little inefficient. So I'll stop there. And uh, uh, I'd like for our uh, panel uh, members to introduce themselves, Joe and uh, Joe Coffey and Audrey Rowe. So both of them have a lot of experience at small and big companies. And Joe and Audrey, if I can ask that you maybe share something uh, that people don't know about you uh, slightly outside of work while you introduce yourself, that'd be great. Um, Joe, do you want to go first? Sure. So I'm Joe Kofi, um, founder of Coffee Consultants. I've worked um, for big companies um, in the East Coast and in and, and the West Coast as well. Um, I've worked for a lot of smaller companies um, and had to wear multiple hats. And so um, this is if, well, if you see gray or my like colored hair, um, some of it is from going through those Excel, <laughs> Excel files um, for weeks and weeks and <laughs> over. Um, so yeah, so, um, I'm, I hope we have a, um, interesting conversation here. Oh, um, tidbit about me. So I, I talked to the, we were talking earlier, I told the panel that I have a, what you would call a sister child. Um, I have a, a sister who is 25 years younger. So she's essentially been my child ever since she's now graduated college and has a job. So I'm done. Now my, I have my own children to raise now. So <laughs> read something about me. Thank you, Joe. Audrey? Yeah, so I'm Audrey Rosso. I've been in the industry over 25 years, mostly just in the Boston area. Um, I will not torture you with my Boston accent. And uh, mostly small companies, so um, sponsor and um, CRO. So um, mostly clinical operations and clinical project management. Like Kalyan, I started out as a CRA, ended up um, where I am now, which is Senior Director of 
clinical operations at a small company in Framingham, Massachusetts, called Alzion. And as the name suggests, we're studying Alzheimer's uh, disease. So, um, you know, one thing, there's lots of strange things about me, but one thing is I'm a Star Trek fan. So I'll just okay. leave it at that. <laughs> so that's me. Nice. Thanks, Audrey. Uh, since I asked the panelists to share something about themselves, I, I think it, it I should say something too that's not uh, completely, that's work-related. I actually love to do magic tricks. So if you see me at conferences, et cetera, uh, I, I love to try my magic on others. I have two kids, five and uh, seven, both girls. So that's that's kind of what keeps me busy at home. So before, uh, you know, both Audrey and Joe have great experience working at, you know, a lot of the small companies and larger ones too. So as we go through uh, today's webinar, we're going to talk through a few, a few concepts, um, topics rather, one is the current challenge in small biotechs. You know, as, as Keith pointed out, there's been uh, funding that's been very tight, and there's been you know, but the, you know, there's been layoffs but in the past couple of years at a lot of the companies. So how do we manage these current challenges at small biotech and outsourcing? A lot of the question that I often get at these conferences is, what do we outsource? What do we not outsource? Is that still the key with small teams? And how do you leverage technology? And, to, and after that, we're going to wrap up with a topic that's very relevant to the industry, which is maybe tips for job seekers, because there are, whether we like it or not, I think the situation right now is such that there are a lot of job seekers um, in the market. So with that, let me get to the, the, the first topic, which is the current challenges at the small biotechs. You know, I think the overall overwhelming theme has been, as I'm having conversations with uh, more and more uh, people from the industry, is we're having to do more with less. There's less money, there's less people, and the expectation is that uh, you know even with these constraints that we still fulfill all our uh, responsibilities and obligations. So, Audrey, can I start with you? Can you share your thoughts on managing uh, financial constraints, especially in the lights of the layoffs and uh, the restrictions that we've had? Yeah, I mean, two things I thought of, and I just thought of another one. Um, so, first of all, you know, layoffs don't oftentimes come um, with a lot of notice. So. You know, what I tend to do is, um, you know, always try to have, you know, job sharing isn't the right term, but, you know, when I when I have a process, I put it together in a either a simple set of instructions, but I make sure that my colleagues know how to do what I do and vice versa if I can. Um, and I do it informally because, you know, someone might say, that, you know, we don't have time for that. But again, um, you know, we were talking earlier before the webinar started that, Sometimes we think, well, we're in such a hurry, we don't have time to do this, or we don't have the money to do that. But um, when someone leaves an organization, they leave with their knowledge. Um, even if they've been there nowadays, it's not uncommon to be somewhere for a year or less. So that's one thing I try to do is really make sure everyone knows what everybody's doing and that we have a shared um, file system, whether it's share file or, I mean, SharePoint or Box or whatever it is. Um, because in a small organization, sometimes people are just keeping everything on their desktop, right? So that's a problem. Um, the other thing I was going to say is it's an area where um, using consultants, you know, part-time, full-time, three-quarter time um, is really helpful, subject matter experts, um, because you can't have, uh, you know, starting out or even, you know, depending where you are in your development program, you know, all, everyone in-house you know, financially, because the big term in small companies, are the, the, the key word is runway, right? How many years, months can we stay, you know, can we have the lights on, so to speak? Yeah. Um, and then the other thing I just thought of, because I see someone, a, a participant who I recognize, recognize is them. And maybe we'll get into this later in the in the webinar is that um, in selecting vendors and CROs, uh, despite you know, in my case, sometimes trying to bring on new vendors or CROs, um, service providers, there's this tendency, you know, I'm sure this will be a topic, there's this tendency to go with the big names, you know, or, um, and it's frustrating for folks like myself when we're trying to um, affect change and have, you know, because, so Kalyan, the biggest question I get at conferences is, how can I be your CRO or your vendor of choice? You know, how do, how do you select CROs, you know, like, how do you do it? Because, you know, how do I get my foot in the door? I know I can help you. I know I can yeah. be a good partner because you have 27 people in your company and are you getting the attention you need? So without going off on a tangent, I think that would be my third piece, which is a little bit different 
but um, you know, how do we bring in new um, talent in terms of our outsourcing partners? Yeah, I I think those are great uh, things that you shared, Audrey. I think one of the things that resonates is that you know you talked about having a transition plan or just having the details of what you're, it's a simple thing. It doesn't need any technology. It just needs a word, a word document, trying to keep it simple. And I think that especially saves all the tribal knowledge that uh, somebody might have, especially at smaller companies and things that are in emails, you know, making sure that they're, they're in a talk that, that, uh, that can go a long way without too much of uh, effort there. Thank you, Joe. What are your thoughts of work working at small biotechs with limited budgets? Yeah, so I, I guess what inspired me to start my consultancy or at least um, um, focus on my consultancy um, is that I felt that I could um, help small these small companies have, as as Audrey uh, mentioned, a SME right, a subject matter expert. So when you have when you do hire a consultant, you want to make sure that that person can indeed wear multiple hats, right? Yeah. Um, because you can get you know, if you're paying the person whatever X amount of dollars per hour, where there's a, a, a value sort of um, contract, you can squeeze a lot out of that person or the group, right? And that's sort of where you have to, as a small company, you have to, um, you know, leverage that experience that you don't have internally. Um, so that, I don't know what's happening there. So that, um, oh, okay, so. So that that tremendously helps um, as far as the budget constraints. Um, while there is a um, there's more people in the market, as you mentioned, Kalyan, there's more people in the market now um, looking for work. Um, but are they the right people? Right. And so you you as as if you are a lone PNOPS person or a lone um, um, lead in your in your company while you're doing your regular job because the company needs to do multiple things do you have the time and the the um this or technically the skills to really zoom in and finding the right candidate whether you bring them in full-time or whatever um to to help um you know move, move things forward um with regards to 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 financial constraints um i think what what tends to happen is these some some of these companies are excited about their product um, and they're excited about the potential um, exit, whether it's, um, you know, trying to be bought or whether they're trying to do it all the way. Um, and they look at those numbers. Um, and, and, and so they're like, oh, we're going to make five, you know, five trillion dollars. And, you know, once this thing hits the market, but sometimes they, they don't necessarily know how much is going to take them to develop that to, to get to the point where they can get the five trillion dollars, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you have to sort of have um, you know separate the scientists from the operations and 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 financial piece of it, and have a real honest conversation about how much funding you actually need. And again, you need somebody with experience to be able to vet through that process. Partner with CROs are great. Um, they can give you some a lot of data. Um, the bigger CROs actually have that um, have more resources to give you. Um, but as Audrey mentioned, um, are they the best partner? Even though they they may have the um, the, the people resources, um, at least on the surface, um, and and you might fare better going the medium size with somebody sort of date within your class, right? Um, and I think that's that that's a lot going on when you're trying to you know trying to see your runway cash your cash yeah. burn how much money you need and all that all that um no, thanks joe and, and before we move to keith here for a comment you know we, we talked about people wearing different hats if there's somebody in the audience right now and you know we talk about people at small companies having to wear different hats if there's something that you're uncomfortable with something that you haven't done before how uh, would you go about uh managing something like that do you have any thoughts on no are you asking if you the general have, public no I'm, I'm asking you and audrey oh, so okay. let's say if if someone's in the audience today and mm -hmm. who's having to wear different hats at a small company and perhaps yeah. they're having to do something that they haven't had much experience with yeah um, how have you or audrey either one of you how have you dealt with that in your companies I mean, for me, it's it's all risk management, right? And so I always kind of 
go back to um, GCP, right? So am I am I capable or qualified, excuse me, based on experience, training, and education? So can I write a statistical analysis plan? No, you know, so, um, so I guess for me, it's always evaluating, you know, whether I can do that task. And that's when I would say, you know, this is a risk. And so we need a subject matter expert. Um, and then it's kind of depends on the kind of the volume or the scope of the task. But for me, you know, and, 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 you know, and again, we're talking about, you know, financial constraints. Someone might say, well, well, I, you know, I don't have, you know, we can't get someone. It's sort of like, there's just becomes a point where it's just too risky. Um, yeah. You know, this cost and risk and speed and all that. But to me, it quality really is what I'm talking about. Um, so for me, it's, it's looking for, um, and I'm fortunate because in my company right now, they're open to, you know, if we have something that needs to be done and either we don't have the expertise or the resources, we bring someone in. So, um, okay. Yeah. So perhaps, you know, if you're qualified for it, or if you can get it to a certain point, get it to that point and then bring somebody in who can actually help you with that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's a great yeah. suggestion. Keith, can, um, uh, let me follow up with you. You know, I'm sure you've sure. worked with a lot of small companies. Your thoughts? Yeah, I'm I'm chomping up a bit to talk because I I listened to what both Audrey and, and Joe had to say, and a couple things resonated very well. Audrey talked about runway, and, and Joe mentioned burn rate. You know, the reality is different companies do different things, and when you deal with both large and small companies, a lot of issues happen. When I talk with companies at very large pharmaceutical companies they have their own set of problems because they're dealing with large volumes of, of data, multiple products, multiple geographies that they're doing. Small companies, a lot of times are just trying to survive, you know, and that's part of the issue is they're trying to figure out how do I get to, to tomorrow? Um, typically the CEOs are always in a fundraising mode. So they're always out there looking at, they're relying on their people to get the job done and to move them to a next phase or get some success so they can actually raise more money and try to do that. So I think it's really important that um, the concept of fit for purpose. How do we get the right tools for the right people in the right time as a company, as a company grows and and what they need to actually do that growth? So I think that's a really um, important part. You talked about people a little bit. And sometimes when you pull somebody in, you could you be in a small biotech, but all of a sudden you pull in somebody who was head of regulatory or head of quality at a, at a large pharma company. They might've had a whole staff that was doing 10 different things and, and they never really rolled up their sleeve. They were just managing all these people. They knew in general what they needed. But when they get down to the small biotech, they're kind of hamstrung because they can't can't dig in deep and they can't give you the, the benefit of, of what they need to give you um, at that day and age. Or they may come in and say, oh, in order for me to get this job done, I need these tools. And the reality is they may go out and they may, they may find these very expensive tools that have no business being put into a small company and because they don't have the support structure, they're overkill for what you're trying to do. You know, those some of those products are engineered for, you know, large portfolios of, of products that you have, multiple countries, all these things. You're trying to get one product through that first IND NDA. And, and um, it's just, you, you just wasted a quarter of a million or a half a million dollars on a piece of software that you can't even support. And then within a year, that person may leave and then you're stuck with that application. So what a waste of money that is. So it's a, figuring out, what do we need to put in place today to help us get to tomorrow? Because our CEO is going to be out there raising more money at some point in the future when we need that, we'll, when we can afford that, we can do that. You know, I hear stories all the time about different CEOs who have done it multiple times and they'll say, hey, I'm only going to take what I need at this point because if I take more than that, we're going to waste it. And they want to do that step function as they grow the company. So I think those are important concepts when you think about how do you grow a small business? How do you grow a small biotech? And bringing the right people in, Audrey mentioned um, bringing people in part time as you need to for some of those capabilities. That's a huge uh, um, benefit. And actually, with a lot of these people that are laid off from different companies, a lot of times they're they're more than willing to work part time because they want to check you out too, because because they, they've been burned before. You know, they they worry about their own job security. How many people have you met who have who've gone from layoff to layoff to layoff to layoff? There's kind of a fatigue factor that comes when you get laid off from multiple companies in a row. So I think that's something you also have to think about as you're putting uh, these teams together. Uh, Audrey or Joe, any comment on those? No, I think it makes, I, I mean, yes, I think it makes perfect sense. Um, 
that uh, people would be willing to be, you know, look at part time. I mean, it's a big, and we could have a separate webinar. I'm sure, Joe, you could you could help a uh, separate webinar on consulting versus being a full time employee. And I've done it both. But yeah, I think everything you say make, makes a lot of sense. What about you, Joe? Yeah, I agree. I think, um, yeah, and I've spoken to folks reach out to me and they look, they're looking for opportunities and it's, some of them don't actually want to go back into the FTE anymore because of the fatigue and, and, and being, you know, um, some of us are a little, have a little bit more of a tougher skin. Um, mm -hmm. I can work for a company and they can shut down today and I'll just move on, to, you know, um, cause you can't, you can't just harp on the, on the, on, on what's happening. It's just the nature of the business. Um, but yes, um, and, 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 and those people, you're right, um, Keith, it's, it's, it's good to pick up those people for them to actually just do what they like to do. They're not responsible for everything. They're not responsible. Maybe in their previous role, there were multiple hats, right? You need somebody yeah. to just, they, they're just doing the one thing that they like to do. They'll, they're, they're, they're responsible for, and they'll give you a great product, hopefully. Um, and, 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 you know, keep 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 things going but yes i i, I agree with you there you know one other, that... thing, one other thing Kelly, that i wanted to kind of bring up too was a lot of times you're going to get these great scientists or people that have come up with these great ideas and they bring them out of the the incubators bring them out of the labs and they get them out and they get a ton of money to start a company they start things up but they they really aren't good at running a business mm -hmm. and it's getting that business function at the same time as you have your scientific functions working together hand in hand to help move yourself forward. So I think that's a big part of, of kind of building that team up as you're driving it forward. Yeah. I think that it's, it, it's, it's happened now a, a lot that I've seen anyways, uh, I've at least five companies that I've looked at in, in, in the last couple of months that you have a really exciting, seemingly exciting drug an excited scientist. Some of them are actually new to the industry. And they're trying to do this business and it's like uh it takes a lot more than just excitement and and good science right um it's the it's as, as you as you mentioned is the business uh, acuity and and um the, being able to operationalize what gets you to the to the end um and i think that's where um some some tools um some vendors um can help you bridge that 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 lack of knowledge or lack of um, in, internal resources to, to be able to get there um, and not necessarily rely on your lack of, I mean, I think these some of these companies are relying on themselves um, because yeah. they believe in themselves, but not necessarily um, really have the the what it takes to, to get there. And it, sometimes it's hard to convince them. Yeah, I've got a few yeah. more things to say, but let's, why don't we move on to the next topic, Kelly? Yeah. I think it's time. We we give yeah. a couple of great ones that you want to talk about. Absolutely, and and a couple of things that came up. You know, what what you talked about, Keith, is getting from point A to point B and identifying what you need. I think is a critical factor. And when you do that, when you identify, you know, how to get from point A to point B, and now you're selecting vendors and selecting the right vendors is actually probably one of the most accurate predictors of how your study is going to go. If you have great vendors, good collaboration, things may go well. If not. You know, we've all seen the the challenges. So if we'll talk about a little bit more about uh, the, sometimes probably working with the largest CRO is not the best choice or working with the largest TMF vendor. You're spending a lot of money as a small company. Do you want to spend that money? We'll talk about that in, in just a bit. So I think the main thing is if you have a small te team, moving on to our next topic, it's outsourcing the key. Is outsourcing still the key to it? And with fewer people, with more outsourcing, are you able to balance this? So how do you decide, you know, is that still the key? And the question is, um, how do you decide what to outsource, what not to outsource? Sometimes, you know, I've had companies use multiple CROs to save money. Is that a good option? Perhaps we'll, uh, we'll get started with Joe on this topic and then follow it with Audrey. Yeah, so I, and I've done, I've done where I've used multiple CROs because they just happen to have the expertise in the region that I, that I needed them in. Um, and so I've done that a couple of times in the past. Um, it's it's hard to manage um, because now you're managing for one program, you have two CROs, or or if you have a program with multiple studies, you may have four CROs to deal with. So there's a challenge there, um, but it's doable, right? Um, it, the approach that I took is essentially you made one CRO the boss, and the rest of them just manage, you know, were managed through that major CRO, and that works. 
deciding whether or not to outsource, I mean, it's just, if you have an internal resource resources or have a network of um, vendors that can support that you, that you trust, or, well, you trust and doesn't mean anything, that has the capacity yeah. <laughs> to deliver for you, um, yes, you can do it. Um, having that network of vendors, the act itself is difficult because then you have to either have tried them out somewhere before um, because you know they can't just go off of what they present you on on when they're doing the bid defense because you know the 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 details is not even in the pudding it's below that right and it's it's once the the pavement the rubber hits the road I guess it's the saying is when you you can actually uncover um, what they, they may be lacking so yeah it's you know, it's good to have experienced people to, on on the team to make that determination okay we can do this if we had one or two or three these three vendors and we can do it ourselves or we don't even have SOPs we don't have anything so let's yeah. just go with the CRO um that has the experience and 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 again the difference between the big CROs and this medium sized CRO and the small CROs is a lot of times cost um but when you're looking at costs you can't just look at the you know the cost on 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 the CRO cost Right, because there's an internal cost as well. The labor, the time and time and money that you folks are spending doing these tasks, is it worth? Are you, are you paying somebody three hundred thousand dollars, where you can pay the CRO two hundred thousand dollars to do it something right? And that's where you have to sort of um, be knowledgeable enough to to make that distinction. And it can't be on you know, you can't do that on a whim. It has to be really based yeah. on data. Yeah. No, thanks, Joe and Audrey. You know. That's very useful points, Joe. And you know, along those lines, Audrey, you work with large ones, small ones. You've selected large, small CROs. Um, perhaps our, you can help our audience, you know, uh, maybe with some uh, tips about uh, how you went about it, how it worked out, and what might be the best strategy in terms of selecting and managing vendors. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing to understand is that it depends. Like I've been in different organizations where I've had, you know, done all the footwork done a slide deck, presented it to my chief, my CMO, and he has he or she has a lot of sway or de decision making. I've been on the other end of the spectrum where it doesn't matter what I say, or I come into an organization where the de decision's already been made, right? So that's where, you know, if I'm a sponsor and I'm at a conference and someone says, how do you sponsor, select um, a CRO? It's like, it's not a simple answer. Um, and... So there's a continuum there, but um, basically, you know, again, having been in mostly small companies, we always have to outsource to some degree. I yeah. think that it's the, going through the process. It's not always about the money. It's about the fit. It's about the um, therapeutic area. And, you know, sometimes I do prefer, I prefer to um, have multiple um, service providers because for example, you know, if the primary um, endpoint is, critical or we have multiple studies, you know, that may be a vendor that I want to work with. Um, we want to work with so like in COPD, we, we might want to work directly with the C, uh, the spirometry vendor, central spirometry vendor. Um, you know, so that that's sometimes something we do, but you're right. The more, um, the more CROs, the more vendors, the trickier it is, but, but sometimes that's just the way it needs to be. And the other thing is where's the expertise? Um, yeah. I think site management, site relationships, patient recruitment, which I don't mean patient recruitment vendors. I mean, the whole, and again, that's fodder for another whole other webinar, mm -hmm. um, you know, managing all that. Sometimes it really, the sponsor should be doing that. It's the best person. Mm -hmm. That's the subject matter expert, so to speak. So I think um, we're always going to outsource. It's a question of, you know, what are the areas, again, risk, risk management, what are the areas that really need the TLC from the sponsor? Um, but then what are the areas which we have to say, look, you, look, Sarah, you're better at this than I am, or you're better okay. in, you know, parts of um, whatever, South Africa or uh, Iceland or whatever, um, and you have the expertise. And so, um, and again, I will say that there have been many times where, you know, someone has just said, we're going to go with, you name a large, global, well-known CRO. Yeah. It's just, it is what it is. And, um, or again, I've come into an organization where that decision was made. And sometimes, keep... uh, so to add a little flavor right. to that, so sometimes your particular CRO that you may pick for a majority of the activities, if it's full service CRO, 
there might be like one or two things into to your point, uh, Marjorie, where there's a particular um, special thing about your study that the CRO doesn't necessarily may not do as as well, right? And so you may have to have a, a almost a full service CRO, right? And you have you move the say the the biostats piece of it, you move out and give it to another, or the data management you move out. And obviously that also brings a little bit of complication because you're gonna have to manage yeah. all that. But but it's it's you know so you essentially have three choices. You can you can do it yourself. Um, you can have the CRO do it, or you can have a company that like this just that, right? And 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 bring them in the piece. And obviously then that's more more communication lines, and you have to right. learn to manage that. I think the two points that came out of there is one is you know. It's it's not an easy easy decision to decide you know what you're going to outsource, but you have to do an internal analysis, and there is that option. You don't have to give it entirely to the CRO. You can take parts of it back and challenge your CRO to uh, to bid on specific things. Do you know? Give me a bid with biostats, without biostats, right. with something else, without something else. Have them do those uh, combos and have them do the work, and you can do the analysis. And the other thing that I just as a wrap up to what uh, Joe's point was, you know, when you outsource and you are outsourcing to multiple vendors, I think what I heard was that, you know, you better have the SOPs and the manpower to manage those vendors because that's also something very important because ultimately you are accountable and responsible as a sponsor for the trial. And with that, Keith, I want to bring you in and ask you, are FSPs making a comeback? Absolutely. And I think I was, I was a point I was going to make. Joe talked about the three different areas but the reality is I think the functional service providers are really starting to make a comeback for, for people looking at that because a lot of people are actually trying to do more themselves. So it's easier for them to do it themselves and then just use functional service providers for pieces that they don't want to do um, and, and pull those, those companies in. Um, the other issue that you have, particularly for small companies, when you're dealing with a, um, a, a large CRO, one of the other things, and we're going to have a question about leveraging technology coming up, but when you think about it, sometimes when you're dealing with the large CROs, they force you to use technology that's either antiquated or over the top for what you need as a small company, and they and they make you pay for it. And that's part of the that's part of that cost model. That's where some of the when you think about um, that run rate that you're doing, if you've got your own tools that are much less expensive than what they've got, have them use your tools instead of that, so that you'll still have it. You always you're always going to end up getting that data back anyway. So why don't you w work with them to do those kind of things? So I think that's a huge area where you're looking at. But but FSPs are definitely um, making a comeback, and I I see a lot of people. We work with a lot of companies that are specific specific for certain areas, and I think it's important when when we as vendors in the industry start working with people that we like to work with, it's because they do a good job and the customers are happy. Uh, nobody wants to work with somebody who's who gets keeps getting thrown out or or are they doing a rotten job? So you're going to see a lot of that kind of work as it, as it comes out and and talk to your existing vendors and ask them who they've worked with. Ask them who they thought that would, would, was somebody that, that would be good for this size company. Again, that, that whole concept of fit for purpose. There are certain CROs out there that are really great in this therapeutic area. You know, they've got a smaller team. They understand this. The lead guy that was there, that's what he started with. You know, they knew, they, they knew you know, CNS or they knew pain or they, any of the different areas that they are, talk to those guys. And maybe maybe when you need to do a worldwide study, they're not the right one, but maybe they can be part of, of getting to that that worldwide study, right? And then you can afford to do it because you, you've raised more money or you've shown good results to get to that point. Well, thanks, Keith. I mean, definitely. And if if they want, if people want to know who these FSPs are, I think one of the good ways is to get to these uh, local conferences that are free. Uh, just go out there. A lot of times, I think one of the challenges, we don't know who does what out there. So some of these smaller conferences can be great places to talk to these vendors and, and figure out if they're the right fit for you. Um, so well, I will put a plug in, Kelly, and I'll, okay, I'll put a plug in for, um, there's a group that I work with on a marketing perspective, um, and they do a really good job of bringing in the right clinical people and bringing them together. And the, the presentations they do I actually get a lot out of it from my perspective as a vendor. I hear what is really pertinent in the industry. So there's a group called Marcus Evans that we use and, and we go to their sessions all the time. The, the heads of clinical operations development, they'll come in, they get comp to go there, but they get to learn a lot about that. The other good part about that for a small biotech is you really have some great peer networking that you can get at these kind of things. When you're out of the office and you go to a place that you're listening to these things on patient recruitment, 
or DEI issues or other issues with other people in your industry, it's great to sit around a round table and talk with other people about those same issues. And then what happens is you network with those people, you get their contact information. Now you can talk outside of that conference. I think that's so important for people in this industry to network with their peers and be able to do that kind of work. Yeah. And, you know, I've been at Marcus as a sponsor and as a vendor. I think the good thing for small pharma I, I, as an attendee is it's, it's absolutely free for attending. And uh, you get a couple of good days to, to talk to all the vendors. It's, it's pretty tiring, <laughs> the conferences, but yeah, definitely a good place to get to know your vendors. And if there are anybody in the audience who want to know about which conferences to attend, because I attend quite a few in the <laughs> year, I'm happy to share mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. information about, uh, you know, how you can attend some of these conferences at, the, at minimum, you know, at no cost and get to know some of these vendors, because I don't think there's any other way for us to know about who's doing what out there. Um, so with that, you know, let's move a little a little into, uh, you know, with smaller companies, leveraging technology is something that people are talking about quite a bit, and it's not a webinar or a seminar without talking about uh, AI. Uh, and something that I have personally felt is that, uh, I mean, I have a technology company myself, but I feel there's a lot that you can do without technology. You know, some of the things that we do in, in EquinOps or in in, uh, in other areas, there's a lot that we can do without technology. Something like, you know, we, I remember one thing that was a, that used to worry me quite, bother me quite a bit is we used to uh, review 100% of the IMBRs. Do we have to do it? Can we make a decision to review maybe 10 to 20%? So uh, anything that you can share, Joe or Audrey, in terms of what you possibly can do without, we'll get to technology in just in just a bit. There's a place for AI. But without technology, would you agree there's a maybe a lot of uh, space for just automation, perhaps? Automation without technology? Both. You know, okay. you know, one is probably you can you can decide what to do with your internal processes. You can mm -hmm. improve your internal processes, perhaps decide on, um, you know, maybe we don't need to review 100% of the IMVRs, et cetera. But, yeah. And then you can do some with technology too, but either one, yeah. go for it. So, so I guess things that, you know, risk-based monitoring has been around for a while, for a long time. We haven't necessarily pinned it down yet, at least in my experience, um, but it's it's getting better. Because I yeah. think more and more companies are accepting the fact that we don't need to review everything. You can you can you can sort of look for outliers, and if any everything else is in range, it's probably fine. Um, yeah. And so that I think that the industry is sort of now getting there, and people are getting more comfortable with. And again, we'll go to the technology, but more comfortable with AI because I think people trust that it it works, and so that it can it can find those outliers that a human being would be looking for. Um, so I think it's going to get better. Um, this industry is partially a, a, a interpersonal sort of um, business, right? If you know, I remember when I was a monitor, um, you know, I would I my study coordinator was my best friend. I, when I, whenever we go out, we go to lunch. We have that you know people to people touch. Um, that has to be within the company itself. When a company is not cohesive internally, it shows on the outside. Um, so that, you know, I think, um, that piece cannot be replaced by AI, hopefully, hopefully, who knows? I don't know. I'm not an engineer, so I don't know what, what's <laughs> possible. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think that, that piece, we still need people to do this work, but I think, um, we need to more and more embrace, um, automation sort of policies to get certain things that we are stuck on, um, you know, unstuck. Um, I went to a conference at the FDA a couple of months ago and they're like, you guys just put restrictions on yourselves for no good reason. We're not expecting you to do all these things. We're not expecting this, right? Um, yeah. and, but we are afraid of the FDA. And so it was like, we got, everything's got to, nobody wants to be audited. Nobody wants to, you know, um, get in trouble with the FDA, but they, they're they actually pretty, pretty, um, you know, um, flexible. Um, yeah. You just need to talk to them along the way. I think that's where you can't just go off and do whatever keep it engaged with the FDA. Um, but they, they uh, even for AI, they're I think they're gonna release their guidance document for AI in a couple of months. Um so but yeah there's there's it's just companies, you know, you have some of us old school people have our old school ways. I was in the days where we used paper CRS and it had to rip pages. Um, you know, which is fine. It had it had its it had its moments. FedEx made a lot of money. Um, by just shipping, you know, you have this three piece and you have to ship them separately in case someone, so one of it got yeah. lost. Um, and I think gradually 
Um, we got we moved away from that and trusted EDC enough to put data in there. Um, and 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 at some point there's going to be an M, you know, um, MVR, yeah. um, you know, um, electronic um, medical records, um, merge into your database and pull what you need and all those. There's a policy yeah. change and our comfort level as an industry to get there to shorten some of this, some of yeah. some of these things out. Yeah. Nicely put, um, Joe. I, I think I could have phrased that question better, but I think it, it, there's three things. One is, can you improve your internal processes, you know, just without technology? And that's mm -hmm. when, when you come out to these conferences, et cetera, you talk to other people and you can figure out how some other people might be saving some time or, you know, uh, you get more confidence that others are doing it. So can mm -hmm. we, instead of, you know, doing every, you know, and shorten some of the uh, process times, I guess. And then there is, AI, which I think is is getting there, but I think we can we can get to intelligence first, and then there's a lot of room for automation, in my opinion, and which is why you know one of the reasons we we started Clean AI. Um, but you know, can I can I bring in Keith? Keith, can you share the uh, the the group that you're at DIA where you know they renamed the name of the team and and the reasons why? <clears throat> I think it kind of tells you about what AI can do, and you know perhaps there's a step even before AI that you need to get to before. Um, using artificial intelligence. Keith? Yeah, I'm, DIA is a Drug Information Association. I'm on a working group out there. And it was an AI working group. We actually renamed ourselves the Intelligent Automation Working Group because AI is a function of a of a bigger whole. There's a lot of things between AI and machine learning and in, in automation that you really need to think about how you can incorporate some of those, those capabilities out there. Um, you know, when you start to look at AI as an enabler of, of solutions that you can bring to the table, one of the problems that you have, particularly with small biotechs, is most of those companies can't afford some of the solutions out there, or they can't afford to develop those solutions because, again, they're just trying to stay alive. So one of the tacks that we've taken is we work with our partner companies in the AI space, and we work with the very large companies to help develop some of these tools. And then I want to bring those tools down to those smaller companies because they're the ones that can really need them. Like we developed a TMF auto classification tool. We're working with some very large companies to develop that tool. But the reality is it's those smaller companies that don't have a lot of bandwidth for their uh, CRAs or CTAs. They need something that can actually save them time every time they get documents in from a clinical site. So they want to be able to put that out there. Uh, we work with a company called Doxonomy. Um, great company. They've got this advanced searching engine and they've got their own version of ChatGPT. You put inside your own firewall. Because some of the things we worry about from an AI perspective, particularly in the life science world is, how do I keep my data and my IP segregated from yeah. the rest of the world? And how do we keep it in-house so that we're working at stuff? But I still need the machine learning capabilities that we find elsewhere. How do we bring those together? So working with partners that, that work with both small and large companies can help you to do some of that stuff. But I see AI not as replacing jobs, but helping those people within those companies. You don't need as much staff to do some of the work that you're doing, or you're going to take limited resources you have and make them far more efficient at doing their job. And I think that's a really important part of looking at how can AI really help us as a company move forward without having to buy, you know, hire all these people to do all these manual things. Identifying what those manual things are is like yeah. one of your first things. And I think that's where we come in um, looking at how do I take not just the data scientists or the AI engineers, but you got to take the subject matter experts. People yeah. like Joe and, and Audrey, they know what people are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. It's those guys tied together with the AI company. That's how we come up with the solutions that we can bring to the market because they're going to see where people spend too much time doing things manually. So yeah. putting in place that resolve that or help that is going to be vitally important. Yeah, I think the main takeaway for me there is that smaller companies may not have enough data to have their own AI models, but then that's the, where they got to work with the vendors who can help them potentially with some of these challenges. Um, so can I, if I can move to Audrey, Audrey, you know, are there any other cases where you've used technology to make your life easier? Um, unless I go into my um, story about my two studies and my six CROs, if we're ready, I can go into that. If not, <laughs> Let's do that. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so I think, well, so my opinion on, I mean, the thing with AI, it's anything in our industry seems to be like a, we're like a magnet, right? And it's good because there's a lot of technology. So I was in patient recruitment for a while and, you know, everybody wants to come in and, excuse me, help with that. 
Um, and so I think AI is a little bit like that. It's like going to the grocery store and everything's gluten-free, like pickles, they're gluten-free. Pickles have always been gluten-free, right? <laughs> so, you know what I mean? And now they're more expensive. Eggs, they're gluten-free. They've always been gluten-free. So, you know, I'm kind of, kind of, it's new for me and I, I don't know where to apply it. And then, and then I have, you know, in my company, it's like, we're so focused on our phase three data that like, we can't even think about anything else. So, because as, as Kate said, we just want to stay alive. We just want to stay around. Um, so, and many companies, as you know, have had to kind of pare down not only their people, but they're, okay, I've got three things in the pipeline. I can only afford to focus on one. So I'll put those two other two on the shelf. Um, anyway, back in another company, a couple of companies ago, um, I had the task of, um, we had two studies. One was sort of an open label extension of one, and we were trying to get you know, to select a CRO, for some reason we were looking at six. I think we had like um, kind of two small, two medium, and two larger CROs. That's 12 bids I had to look at. So some, it's a story about how KO and I got connected, but um, I used his tool to basically, um, so traditionally we get, so I would have had, I would have had six piles of paper on my desk. I mean, 12, excuse me, six CROs, two studies, six piles of paper. It probably would have taken me weeks to try to compare what those numbers were telling me, right? I mean, maybe easier with the, the two studies from each of the six CROs. Um, but, but what Clint AI has done is kind of had the CROs put their data into the tool um, and there was a little, you know, kind of negotiating in terms of, you know, no, you don't have to sit there, CRO, and, and type it in. There's different ways you can get it in Excel files and other ways that um, you can get your data in. And then what comes out is some analytics about, you know, it's, you know, a graph about here are the different functional areas, medical writing, QA, regulatory, monitoring, um, stats, data management, what am I forgetting, um, whatever. And so each of the six CROs was in a different color. And I just got this graph and where they were very divergent, then I could dive into those areas of the different proposals. And so, and all the data was right there. It was all, it was all in this one file and I could play around. I could say, let me just look at medical writing for all the CROs. Let me look at stats and data management. Um, let me look at them in the different countries. So um, that's where the AI was really you know, that's an example where I was like, okay, this is cool because it just cut down so much work. And again, it's like not reading every monitor visit report. It was like, I don't need to read every line item of every bit. I need to know where they're really diverging because either I didn't give that CRO the right information. And it's not like, okay, well, you had your chance and your curve is weird, so you're out. It was, let me have some conversations and we document those Q and A's in the system so that I want to make sure everybody got the same information. And are you truly is your cost truly different or maybe you were adding something fancy in that, you know, I might, might want or might not want. So that was an example and that would have taken me weeks and weeks. Um, now what someone, I think maybe Joe just said was um, in the current um, sort of atmosphere, um, someone could say, well, I'm not, you know, cause previously to that, I had hired a consultant to do it on a different study and she had taken X amount of weeks and X hours and X amount of dollars to that exercise. Now I'm sure my manager would say, no consultant, you do it. It's your job because the, because the market's tight, right? So I want to keep my job. I don't want to get laid off, but instead of spending two weeks doing this, now I have a tool that's you know, I won't go into pricing, but affordable for my company. So instead of spending weeks and weeks, because I've got other things to do, right? I'm, I was a department of one. I've got to run a couple of clinical trials. So for me, that's an example where it can be very um, effective in terms of not looking at every line item of every CRO, which is what I used to do, because otherwise I wasn't quite sure how it was all panning out. So for me, you know, that's an example where it makes sense to me. Um, so I'll stop there and see if there are either questions in the Q&A or, um, you know, that's no, something I, that I could really under, sorry, that I could really understand yeah. on my level because I have looked at so many CRA, CRO proposals and I want it to be equitable. I want it to be, they should be different, right? One CRO, mm -hmm. they want to be different, right? They have different skill sets and I want that reflected in it. And it is, but I also don't want to get lost in all the, the detail that I can't actually see the forest for the trees.
Yeah, and Audrey was one of our earliest adopters. I mean, talking about you know using ClinAI for the CRO selection. So I distinctly remember that you know some CROs might come in lower because their investigative grants are lower. Or you know that's not really something that you're going to save because that's a, just a pass through cost. So, but I remember, and I think that's you know be, be successfully partnered, uh, Audrey, with you and I to you know to help you compare these different complicated CRO bits and help you select the best vendor. But I think that's one of the things too, is to be open to smaller vendors. And if somebody's offering you a good value, you might be able to get something significant done for a relatively low price. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Audrey. And we'll, we'll keep an eye on the, on the questions there. Uh, but Joe, I mean, anything else to add to that? Yeah, I think, you know, picking back on what Audrey said, it's, it really helps you focus on what's important, right? And so you're not, you know, the, because in, in, in that process, not that you're only, you're reviewing it and depending on the size of your company, you have to go convince other people or get other people's votes and, and, and get their input in making that decision. Um, so you have to look at that information, digest it, do, you know, do your own presentation to present CRO A versus B, or maybe the top three or the top four. And that, the at least from, from my experience, it helped me really you know, just move it along very quickly. And I did all the, all that through, through the system. Um, and one story, I know we were short on time, so I'll make it quick, is that, you know, we went in, we had our idea of what CROs we were going to pick because we knew them from before and um, we put them side by side with other CROs. Um, we asked them the same questions and and realized that we were wrong in our assumptions in, in, in going for that CRO. So it would help to actually move to select a different CRO, which was more um, data-based decision versus, oh, we feel comfortable with this with this CRO. And that, you know, for a company that's struggling when they need money, that's that's that really is 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 key. Um you yeah. know, I work for you know, a small company and and with the mod, mod, you know a modest budget and ended up saving like eight point five million dollars, which is that's a whole study or two, because if we had picked up the other CRO, it would have cost us X amount of money. But because we picked this other CRO, which did pretty much the same thing and had some added values in there as well, we we benefited benefited from having that extra, and, and it's not it's not small money. Um, that's that's at least a year or six months <laughs> of yeah. of survival, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's. Uh, that's meaningful, but I just want to be respectful of the time since we only have yeah, six minutes. And it, that's the and that's the kind of feedback I think that uh, that makes it worthwhile, you know, to yeah. to to run the company because that's the gap that I that I saw when I was in operations, and I'm yeah. I'm glad that this is for anybody who's not familiar with Clinia, not to do a shameless plug there, but it, that it's a, it's a platform for companies to create their RFP, send it out to the vendors, and no more Excel files because when you're dealing with when you're trying to decide how to spend thirty forty million dollars. I think it makes sense to use something a little more advanced than Excel, because you know it's it's hard to compare the vendors when you negotiate. Let's say if they change some numbers, it's hard. You got to start the comparison process again. So if anybody's curious about it, you know I'm more than happy to share them more about it. But and Kale, uh, can I yeah, go ahead, Keith. I was going to move to you. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> so I just want to I just want to add that you know one of the reasons that I will will talk to our client base about Clean AI and what Kellyan brings to the table is the fact that he also has a module that can work with existing things. I know Audrey said earlier how she got into a company and they had already picked their vendors. Well, now the issue you're gonna have is that if you have um, a vendor that's doing a, multiple trials or doing a trial for you, and all of a sudden you're getting change order over and over and over again, you're gonna get change order fatigue from those kind of things, having to go back and figure those out. <clears throat> the fact that you can also do that and help them save money as well, I think is really important. So I think that, that your background coming out of the industry and understanding that helps you to put together tools that are just right for the, the companies that we're talking about. So I, I don't hesitate at all to bring you into to companies when we're talking about that, because I think they really can benefit from, from what you bring to the table. The other thing I would say is, sorry, Kelly, is like oh, go definitely go to conferences on AI because it's fascinating. Like there was a speaker at one he was at Pfizer and they, they really have done, I mean, there's definitely many, many areas that AI can help for sure. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not very, other than <clears throat> that particular CRO vendor selection uh, platform that I, I use and like, I, I'm not that well versed in it, but I imagine it's, you know, it's, it's amazing. So go to conferences. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a lot of opportunity and unfortunately we don't have a better way of sharing knowledge across each other. 
It's yeah. only when you go talk to people that you're able to learn more. Um, I know we're almost out of time here, but we do want to talk about, uh, you know, how can people find, you know, it's a tough market. There are a lot of people looking for jobs. Any tips that you can share real quick on um, how to find those opportunities that, you know, your next opportunity rather? Yeah, I mean, I see, I think it's the same thing. You go to conferences. Um, I mean, since you may be in between jobs, you find some free local ones that doesn't cost you too much. Um, join these groups, the the LinkedIn groups that are doing um, you know, you know, virtual conferences and webinars. Um, it's it's networking, right? And it's um the 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 companies that are seem to be doing more hiring um are the smaller ones because they need the people. Um the bigger ones, um I, I know Keith said the AI is not replacing people, um, but it's it, it's slowing down the need for more people, right? which in a sense it's because otherwise somebody else would get hired. Um, and so this bigger companies are using that to their benefit, but you know, the smaller companies go to these small conferences. Um, and, and that's, that's, that's sort of, I think where, where the target is. And again, it, and, and I, I don't know if you want to cover it later, but it's not necessarily a CRO or pharma or whatever. These vendors are also hiring. Right. Um, and so, don't just go to Keith, go to Kalyan, you know, whoever, <laughs> these are other vendors that are, um, you know, have have expertise, You're they may need your expertise in, in what the service that they provide to their clients. I think that's that's one of the big points. Is you, yeah, just don't look at sponsors. There's a lot of vendors that can use your expertise too. Keith, did you want to add to this? I saw. Yeah, I was going to say in, in, in the Boston, I know I'm, we're in Massachusetts. So in the Boston, Cambridge area, there's all sorts of different events that happen. There's uh, um, some groups that meet on a regular basis. Um, there, there's a group that meets for, it's Biotech and Brews out in Boston. They, they meet in Cambridge at a different bar. They usually get a vendor like Port Square. Well, I, I've sponsored a, a night out there. You go out there and you get some free beer and you get to talk to other people and other biotechs. You know, it's a great way to get around to see who's doing what. And I think those are really um, important things. Sometimes if, you know, one of the problems with us being in a virtual world now is that we are all virtual and we can't do it. So, you got to try to figure out how do I get into some of these areas where we can do, um, you know, crosstalk within applications. But, but I think going out and meeting with people at these kind of events, it's huge. Yeah. And Sylvain Bedard, who's on the call, is sharing something really interesting is that he's saying many roles are never posted, especially the contract ones. So you really have to, you know, talk to, uh, you know, people that are, um, you know, that can help you find that are doing staffing, et cetera, to actually find these roles. Because if they're not posted, how are you going to even find them if you're not networking? Audrey, your yeah, comment, I and we'll think, close this topic out. Go ahead. Yeah, I saw Sylvain's comment, and I think it's the same thing. It's just networking. I think LinkedIn, I mean, the things that are going on LinkedIn lately, some of them are kind of left of center. So, um, you know, and I, and I get it. I think people are really scared and really frustrated. But um, I think networking and, and, you know, just, just letting people know, you know, through your networks, I'm looking, um, and Actually, uh, Audrey, when you mentioned LinkedIn, I think people of you, people that are, that have good backgrounds, if they respond back to other LinkedIn posts, people are going to see your yes. back as well. So that's a yes. great, networking yes. capability. that social media can help you to find other people to talk to. Yes, I mean, I'm, I definitely think you should be active on LinkedIn. Look what's on there. Stay, stay involved there. Um, and then, you know, I'm not, I don't really, I'm not really tapped into the like recruiters thing as much anymore. Yeah. Um, there are one or two that I work with, but, um, and then I think Keith, you had said something last time we spoke about, you know, maybe keeping an eye, maybe through Fierce Biotech, but looking at what companies are getting funding, maybe going yeah. to their websites and applying that way. Um, and a kind of a different proactive approach. Um, yeah, that might be an idea too, because I know Fierce Biotech, fortunately Fierce Biotech keeps a layoff tracker, but they, yeah. also, keep, <laughs> they also keep, a, I think, a funding tracker now. So um, hopefully we can look at that one. Those are all great tips. Thanks, thanks, Audrey. I think we're, we'll take just one question. If, uh, if there are small biotechs that are trying to start new programs or anything like that, what's the one thing that they can do from the beginning to save costs or start out the best way so that they're not uh, making any of the mistakes? Can you share one tip for them? What's your biggest uh, that you would share? 
You know, I'd have, sorry, I'd have their CEO talk to other CEOs. I don't know if there's like a CEO club, but I had a couple of CEOs uh, when I was working for a Belgian company come over and we went over there and they they spoke to us and it was like the stories they told about how much of it's just luck, but again, networking, have, have the folks in the C-suite network. I, I guess that would be my only advice. Okay. Thanks, Audrey. Joe, anything to close out? Any comments? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think I agree that I, I, there's, there's, a company, well, this this group that I ran across a couple of weeks ago that does like um, um, execs recruiting or something or other, and they they do a pretty good job of, um, sort of keeping folks on in the C suite informed and what they sort of need to do in the beginning of the of, of the building of the companies, and they have some tracks track um, track record as well. So, I mean, I think that's you know, lear learning from somebody who's been through it is is yeah. probably the best best approach. It's interesting. I'm hosting a CEO panel next week, so I'm going to tell them to talk to each other. Nice. <laughs> Keith, any comments and do you want to close us out? Last thing I could think is, again, I, I talk about that fit for purpose, whether it's technology, whether it's people, it's all those things. Think of where you are in your journey and get the right thing for that point in time and then build to where you want. Walk before you run. Absolutely. You know, Audrey and, and Joe, Thank you very much. And then Keith, of course, thanks to everybody for your time. I think that's been a, a very good panel for just to just for small companies. I think the biggest takeaways are in terms of outsourcing, it's not an easy, easy decision to understand what to outsource, what not to outsource. It depends upon your company's tech uh, abilities. And when you do outsource, keep in mind that you have to oversee them. So you have the SOPs and the people in place to do that. Thirdly, technology. I think there's, there's a lot of technology options out there. You got to get out and, you know, go to conferences and understand more. And it look, and going to conferences, if you're looking for an opportunity, I think that's one of the biggest takeaways is go out there, network, and uh, hopefully you'll find your next opportunity if you're looking for one, that is. So I'll, I'll wrap up with that. Keith, any cool closing comments to- uh... Thanks everybody for, for joining us today. Well, hopefully we'll do a few more of these. This will be great. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Joe, Audrey, Thank thanks a lot. It was fun. Right. Thank you. Everyone have a good day. Have a good weekend. Bye now. Bye. Bye-bye.